Hi, good morning, afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to welcome you all for to the session C5, Eating Our Way Out of the Climate Crisis, How Rethinking Our Food System Can Balance the Biosphere. Uh, we are thankful to our sponsor, Sodexo, for this session. And we are going to kick off um, with our first presenter. Rob Morasco is the Senior Director of Culinary, Culinary Development for Sodexo and is going to take us through the presentation. We'll introduce our second speaker for the session. We should also have some time for questions and answers. So if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Rob, I'll hand it off to you. Thanks so much, Sarah. And thanks for having me, everyone. I'm, I'm really honored to be a part of this wonderful, wonderful event. Let's dive right into my favorite topic on the next slide, sustainable eating. I guess it would be the next slide after that. <laughs> Thank you. I like to share this slide because it, it really truly connects Sodexo's corporate responsibility targets around carbon emissions reduction to what, to what we're actually doing with food uh, here in North America, what we like to call the love of food. It's really all about our health and attached to that is our planet's health. While it's certainly true that a, a lot of people, a lot of our customers across the world may have, they may eat more plant-based to improve their health or because uh, there are animal welfare concerns, but the overarching issue really is climate. Anybody can pick up their phone right now and find out uh, a processed food, even like Impossible, cuts carbon over beef by around 90%. And we compare it to whole foods like beans by about 99%. So let's talk about sustainable eating in more detail on my next slide. So I've done conferences and presentations over the past few years, and I've talked about more plant on the plate being the trend, the number one trend. And, and I'm, I've had to admit lately that I was wrong. Uh, it's not the number one trend. It's a true culture shift for anybody that grows, sells, or eats food. Uh, we always have to start with the customer. What are their needs? What are their wants? Uh, the days of a, of a grilled veggie plate stashed away under the dessert section of the menu, those days are gone. Uh, plant dishes have to be what I like to call crave-worthy rock stars, worthy of being at the center, the centerpiece of any menu. Uh, naming conventions are going to be critical here. Um, if you don't want to sell it, I always say, Go ahead and call it vegan, nobody will buy it. Or worse yet, call it healthy and vegan. Um, that being said, innovation in this space is super critical. Let's talk about that on the next slide. Excellent. So innovation is funny when you talk to chefs, you know, my peers and people I work with, it, it, it doesn't always have to mean the tip of the spear, right? The, the, from a culinary perspective. For sure, there's a sizable percentage of our customers and for sure all of us chefs that are looking for that type of innovation, the really, really, really cool stuff. But for our target audience, uh, customers that may identify as flexitarians or, or even meat eaters, we've gotta have menu items for them that are approachable, accessible, and appealing to them. If we have to spend precious seconds explaining what it is, we, we might lose them. A great example on the screen is shepherd's pie. It doesn't get any more simple or recognizable than that. It's plant-based and we're using jackfruit as the, the meat, right? Um, I always recommend getting, a, getting an expert or a partner involved if, if needed. Uh, I haven't met one chef, uh, celebrity or otherwise, that would not jump at the chance to promote plant-based sustainable eating. I also can't think, frankly, of one supplier or manufacturer that's not getting into or already into the plant-based space. Um, I have a number on the screen. That's the plant-based number for Sodexo in North America, year-over-year -year growth of entrees on the menus. We're very proud of that. Um, but for food service overall, you may or may, may not be shocked by this number, but from our friends at Dad Essential, we've seen overall in food service, uh, it's a big number, 2,462% year-over-year growth in plant-based menu items in restaurants and food service. So the train, as they say, has left the station, but as we'll talk on the next slide, it's not too late to hop on board. This might be my favorite topic, uh, Future 50. If you haven't heard of it, um, Sodexo partnered with the World Wildlife Fund and Unilever Nor Food Solutions last year on this initiative. Uh, the main point here on the screen, and I'll, I'll read it to you, 75% of our diet as humans globally comes from 12 crops and five animal species. Future 50 is all about 50 other ingredients that are sustainably sourced in the communities they come from, typically much less resource intense to grow and nutritionally very dense. 
meaning they're good for you and good for the environment. You can go to the next slide, please. Forgot a piece here, sorry. Future 50 includes ingredients as common as red cabbage or chickpeas, or as exotic as amaranth, or my new favorite, phonio. For me, this is where we really start to see the connection come together between sustainable eating and climate change. But none of this can happen without what you see on the screen, training, actionable training, training people can, can grab a hold of. So two years ago, we partnered with the Humane Society here in the United States to create plant-based menus. Uh, I think we did nearly 300 recipes for all of our various business segments. We brought the Humane Society chefs into our Culinary Innovation Center in Maryland, tested the recipes, and then we collaborated on what the training would look like. Uh, the Humane Society Culinary Team, they've, they've trained hundreds of our chefs across the country at dozens of sites. And we're, as you can imagine, right now we're working on deploying virtual training due to what's happening with COVID-19 across the country. We've got some great shots on the screen from trainings that were done at Howard University in Seattle Pacific. Very proud of the work the folks did. And you can see on their faces uh, how awesome it was. And I, I think it's really, really critical for that frontline cook to gain confidence, both in ingredient use and techniques. Our, our, our cooks, when they do this training, often taste new ingredients they've never heard of for the first time and discover they're actually delicious. Um, training the program, I like to call it, menus integrated, recipes, ingredients, it makes what you're doing trainable immediately and deployable immediately. Okay, next slide, let's recap. Okay, number one, get those crave-worthy rock stars on your menus. No afterthoughts here, please. Even if you're just offering an impossible burger as an option for a conventional burger. No more vegetarian burritos, my favorite, that are just burritos with the meat removed. Um, that's not crave-worthy. It's actually the opposite. We're, we're essentially taking something away. Uh, try to be creative and innovative, but from a customer's point of view, you know your customers. What are they looking for? And and I'll, I'll stress this highly, it's, it's not too late to get started. Um, align with suppliers and your on-site teams, get your chefs the training they need. Your frontline staff will sell this if you help them really feel good and comfortable about it. Thank you very much. I'll be around for questions later. I'll hand it back over to Shara now. Hi, Rob. Thank you so oh, much. Sarah, sorry. I know. <laughs> Long time no see. Sorry yeah. to jump in on Shara here. No worries. Um, but now it's my honor to introduce Max Elder, who is research director at the Institute for the Future and is a multidisciplinary researcher, published author, keynote speaker, and trusted advisor to individuals and organizations across the global food system. Max, it's a real pleasure to have you with us today. Welcome to the stage. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you to the CIA for having me. I love menus of change. And uh, it's such an honor to be here. And it's such an honor to go after Rob, who's talked a lot about getting menu items that are rock stars out uh, to the world. And I think Rob himself is a rock star as well. So I'm really, really excited to be here today to talk to you about some of my work at the Institute for the Future. For those of you who are unfamiliar, IFTF is the world's leading futures organization where a 52-year-old nonprofit that helps businesses and governments and social impact organizations around the world combat short-termism. We do research, we do strategy work, we do innovation work, and the thread that ties all of it together is thinking more broadly, creatively, and imaginatively about the future so that we can make more informed decisions in the present. As Sarah said, I'm the research director at IFTF that leads our Food Futures Lab, which is a group of interdisciplinary researchers, designers, and strategists, all who want to make more crave-worthy food systems. And, try, and we all work very hard across the global food value chain with ingredient companies, seed companies, food packaging companies, your big CPGs, foundations with the nutrition or ag focus, all trying to help them make better futures of food. So... I'm so thrilled to be here today to talk to you all about some research that we recently published called Eating Our Way Out of the Climate Crisis. The whole report can be downloaded at this URL, and I'm only going to be able to talk for a little bit about one small piece of the report. But before I dive in, I want to level set a little bit on what foresight is and what this report full of forecasts really means. 
So we at the Institute for the Future try to challenge a lot of assumptions, unearth a lot of biases, and think much more creatively, imaginatively, and provocatively about what might be on the horizon. And so what we do is try to think outside of our very narrow notions of what might be probable on the horizon in the next five or 10 years, even pushing out broader than what might be plausible to really explore, the, to explore this very unique space of what truly is possible. And so we come up with forecasts. These are not predictions. These are instead internally consistent, researched statements about the future that provoke insight in the present. And those forecasts are designed to help us make better decisions today. So often we have to go out into the future 10 years, imagine what could be possible at the extreme so that we can then come back to the present and make a better future. So eating our way out of the climate crisis has five big forecast areas. They range from true cost accounting systems to advanced simulations and modeling technologies to new food influencers to healthier dirt and even more resilient food cultures, all with a focus on figuring out where are the key levers for our food system to help rebalance our biosphere. I'm only going to talk to you all today about one of those, which I think is a really, really important aspect of this whole conversation that often is underappreciated or overlooked. And that is a forecast we call amplifying food influencers. Rob's great presentation talked a lot about how we need crave worthy options that are nourishing for both people and the planet. And what we are looking at at the Institute for the Future is a future possibility where there's a new breed of tastemakers, some new rock stars that help shape the food system towards more plant-based and sustainable diets. And I want to start with a quote from my friend Jason Lusk, who's an agricultural economist at Purdue University, who says that disagreements about the impacts of meat consumption on the planet, or quite frankly, disagreements about the impacts of any type of food and its impact on the environment, are less likely to be settled by science because they're being wrapped up in people's cultural values and tribe identities. And this is really the foundation of what we're looking at at the Institute for the Future. We know that the alternative meat market is expected to grow radically over the next decade. Rob's 2000 percentage uh, data is mind blowing. And we know that these projections are possibilities, but we think that they're just the tip of the iceberg for a much more radical disruption in the meat industry and in the food system more broadly. What we see in the present today is that people like pro athletes, large incumbent meat companies, immigrant chefs, celebrities, um, and even organizations like the CIA are all really blurring traditional assumptions about who promotes plant-based diets. And the key takeaway from this research is that the future of menus of change, the future of sustainable food systems needs to focus less on climate or health benefits, and it needs to really understand and center the discourse around identity politics. We're seeing communities around the world at every different scale adopt meat-free identities at the individual level, even boycott meat businesses, publicly shame people who are eating more carbon-intensive diets. And what's most interesting is that these types of political divides and social identities are becoming more entrenched. So we see this massive opportunity for influencers who are able to cross party lines as really the Trojan horses for introducing climate-friendly diets to new audiences and having impact at scale. So the battle over whether we will be able to amplify menus of change, the battle over whether we'll be able to scale these rock star menu items will really, really, really radically rely not on whether we think of carbon intensive menu items as edible, but instead on how we might redefine traditional notions of things like masculinity, of things like socioeconomic status, and even things like liberal environmentalism. The winning ideologies are going to be the ones that fully understand how to communicate effectively in an extremely polarized environment across these types of party lines. So that is a forecast of what is possible on the horizon, a big opportunity for us to amplify food influencers. What are the signals of change? What are the discrete, specific, local pieces of evidence across our food system that point towards this possibility? The first I want to share from you is actually from Jason Lusk's research, his longitudinal food demand survey in the United States, 
where he's found that beef demand is higher for conservative Republicans than liberal Democrats, and that there's that type of polarization is actually increasing over time. So we need to understand that diets and sustainability are deeply woven with food identity politics, and that we need to fully appreciate that there is an increased polarization and that that increased polarization may move more companies, organizations, and stakeholders across the food system to take a stand politically. I've been so inspired by Beyond Meat and their marketing campaigns. They call themselves the future of protein, and their Go Beyond campaign features pro athletes. There's actually a new Go Beyond commercial that was just released this week that really is reshaping and challenging the sexual politics of meat and the masculinity of meat. What's really fascinating is that these kinds of campaigns are radically rewriting cultural assumptions about what it means to eat meat and what it means in terms of masculinity, strength, performance. And it's debunking, Beyond Meat is debunking a lot of myths about protein consumption. I'm also really inspired looking across social media and the social media landscape. Eric Castro is a really popular um, Instagram uh, influencer who has an Instagram handle called How to Be Vegan in the Hood. And he's a cultural influencer who's in a food swamp with access to bodegas and convenience stores, who's radically shifting perceptions of vegan diets as being something that is not just for an elitist, white, affluent uh, consumer, but instead is embraced and celebrated um, in other cultures, like the African-American and Latino cultures. And he, based in New York City, is creating a massive following of people who are really rethinking their approach to being vegan. I'm also uh, based in San Francisco and I'm incredibly inspired by Eileen Cesara, who's the owner of a Filipino restaurant in San Francisco. That's really radically challenging assumptions that we have about fried meat heavy dishes being traditional for Filipino culture. She's actually trying to decolonize definitions of Filipino food by rediscovering the fact that traditional Filipino food celebrates a very plant-centric diet. And she is really focusing on creating the necessary social infrastructure to decolonize these kinds of diets and recenter them really as a menu of change. The last example that I want to share with you all comes from the U.S. military. Uh, as many of you know, if you do work on food innovation, the military is a really interesting hotbed for innovation. And a lot of advances um, from a food science perspective, from a food quality and assurance perspective, have happened first and foremost uh, under military research and development. So we always look to the military to see what might happen on the horizon. And one of the biggest movements right now is that the meals ready to eat, the MREs from the military, are not plant-based. The military has no plant-based MRE for um, their soldiers. And a growing number of soldiers are creating a movement to pressure the Defense Logistics Agency to provide healthy, balanced, and vegan meals, making them fit for combat. There are a couple of really interesting components of this type of signal. One is, it turns out that our food system is making this country not combat ready. The military is struggling to find people who are fit enough to be able to defend our country. And this is making diets a national security issue. The other really interesting thing is that soldiers are describing their switch towards more plant-centric, plant-friendly, and maybe even entirely plant-based diets as a desire from their work. They say that they engage in so much violence in their professional life that they want to make sure that they have an opportunity to have a healthy, humane, and sustainable meal experience when they sit down to eat. So these are all a series of small-scale local examples across the food system, from the military to restaurant owners to plant-based marketing campaigns to research about American food demand that point towards a future where we radically rewrite who the celebrities are, who the influencers are, in our culture and think very deeply about how these types of influencers might be amplified in new ways to be to cross party lines and to really think deeply about how the politics of diet might be shifting. So 
what does this mean? What does this mean for you all? What does this mean for menus of change? And to Rob's point, what does this mean for amplifying rock stars across our food system? I have a couple of questions that I want to ask you. One is about cultural values and tribe identities. How closely are you tracking these kinds of tribe identities of your eaters, of your stakeholders? Who are the rock stars that are creating sustainable rock star dishes? Where do they have followings and how do you engage with them? Rob talked a lot about how we need to partner with different kinds of celebrities or food service providers. How are you thinking about those partnerships and are you thinking about the politics and the social implications of them? What cultural assumptions do you make? Do your culinary curricula make? Do your meals or menus rely upon? For example, are we making a lot of assumptions about the masculinity of me? And if we are, are you ready to pivot if or when those types of assumptions, those types of social um, values change? And it seems like they're changing pretty radically underneath our feet today. How do you think of your protein choices, for example, as political choices? And are you ready or willing to engage in the politics of this kind of discourse? And then what niche spheres of innovation or influence, like for example, the military, are you monitoring to sense change before it spills over into the broader market? How are you watching this type of transformation? And not just watching, but how do you see yourself as someone who's creating it? Not just letting the future happen to us, but actually feeling like you are enabled, empowered, and emboldened to create a future with menus of change. I want to end with this quote from David Wallace Wells, who wrote a terrific and very scary book called The Uninhabitable Earth last year. And David says that no matter how out of control the climate system seems, with its roiling typhoons, its unprecedented famines and heat waves, refugee crises and climate conflicts, we are all its authors and we're still writing. And if I were to adapt this quote for this audience, I'd say we are all its eaters and we're still eating. So it is incumbent upon us to identify the new types of food influencers that are emerging across the food system and think about how we might amplify them to truly create menus of change. This is one small part of a much larger body of research on how we might eat our way out of the climate crisis. I would really encourage you all to download the report at this URL and to read the other forecasts, these other statements of possibility. And please email me, tweet at me, talk to me about this because I think there's nothing more important today than really rethinking how we approach food systems and how we scale menus of change. So with that, thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Sarah. Max, thank you so much for bringing us all on this journey today. And to continue this conversation, I'm going to bring Rob back on stage to join us. Hi, Rob. Hello, nice job, Max. That was great. Thank you. Now, I'm sure many of you in our audience have questions for our presenters today. So please feel free to type those into the chat and I will make sure to weave them into our conversation. And as those questions come in, Max, I'm gonna start off with a question to you. And so often we think about sustainability and food systems in terms of new product formulations and ingredient innovations to have an impact on climate. But often we fail, and admittedly, myself included, to fully understand or appreciate the social context around these systems that you spoke to earlier. Can you help us further understand about how these social norms around climate change and food choices influence us? Mm. Yeah, that's a very hard question. And I, maybe I'll tie it back to Rob's point about craveability, because I think Rob, you're absolutely right. Dishes, ingredients, menus need to be craveable. Uh, and um, having a burrito without the meat doesn't do the trick. And so, <laughs> right on. <laughs> but then, but here's the, but it begs the question what is craveable? And it turns out that craveability is not some abstract idea about ingredients or about flavor, it is a social construct. And if you, look, if you look at our history, notions of what is craveable, notions of what is edible have shifted. And so when we try to think about how we might scale craveability, 
we need to fully appreciate that craveability is socially defined. There are new influencers who are reshaping those definitions. And we might have to think and partner and engage in unusual parts of the food system or even outside of the food system to engineer craveability and back into the diets that we want, into the menus that we want. So one answer is we need to think beyond uh, the limits of ingredients or products or menu design to think about the social institutions and the social containers that support them. And that's a much more thorny and challenging, I think, conversation than, than a lot of people have in the food system. I'm going to have to add that to my craveability discussion now. Can you write that down? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That's amazing. And Rob, I'm going to have to take that word from you and use it more often. <laughs> I absolutely love it, craveability. Um, and that brings me to another point. So as a chef, Rob, do you see the industry growing further with manufactured plant-based center of plate foods like the Beyond Burger that we talked about or Impossible? Or do you think we're moving forward with more chef-driven and ingredient-based innovations? So that, that's, that's a really great question. I, I, I think most chefs, if you, if you ask them, they're like, I don't like the, the, the burger that's not a burger. It should be food, right? I, I, I don't necessarily disagree with that. But here's the thing. I, I think when we talk about people that identify as flexitarians or meat eaters that may occasionally dip into the plant-based world, a thing like a, a plant-based burger or a plant-based chicken tender or a fish fillet, right? That's not fish. They're 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 craving that thing that they're eating less of or not at all. The texture, the mouthfeel, the 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 whole experience. They're still craving that. They haven't forgotten what that tastes like and they they want to give that a shot and i saw i saw a question come up with in the chat about k-12 and yes, that's, that's a part of our world right and I, and I think it's just like uh a lot of our other business is that you're going to have a percentage of customers that absolutely are willing to try what's the biggest seller in k-12 pizza and chicken tenders right there's some pretty good chicken tenders that aren't made with chicken out there and i, I would i would hazard a guess that a lot of those students would give them a shot um that I, I really think uh, they'd be demanding that if, if we actually if we actually asked them the question, like I was saying before, could we ask our customers what they think about it? But so I think, sorry, long answer to a short question. Both are needed right now. Um, in conversations we've been having with the Humane Society, World Wildlife Fund, I think at some point this is going to come together into some kind of awesome thing. I don't know what that thing is going to be, but for right now, we need both. And then the thing about the chef driven is it's not anything we necessarily have to create. There's a lot of cultures in this world that already eat that way. Exactly. You know, authentically inspired cuisines, you just bring them over and install it and it's already that way. So I think it's, I think there's room for both and our customers, frankly, are looking for both. So Rob, you did, you mentioned just something that I think is really important that ties into the social element. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about flexitarians and one of the really radical things that I think we all haven't fully appreciated is that food identities are changing oh, yeah. and going beyond extremes and binaries of like either I'm a vegan or I'm an omnivore and moving much away from sort of like static nouns towards more dynamic verbs. So I'm looking, I'm flexible yep. or I'm a reducitarian. I'm trying to reduce. And those types of identities are really challenging because it, it maybe I'm just trying to reduce my a certain type of consumption for dinner. Or maybe I'm trying to be flexible on the weekends. And that's really hard to understand how to uh, re speak to, design a menu for, create a food experience for someone who's, everyone, whose identity is a verb. Everyone is really trying to find that identity and our industry has to match that. But unfortunately, on that note, we need to wrap up this compelling conversation. And a huge thank you to Sodexo for sponsoring Menus of Change and this breakout session and especially to you both, Rob and Max, for sharing so many great insights with us today. The networking break is about to get underway, and we're excited to share the short presentation with the details on all of the opportunities to network and engage with your colleagues during this coming break. Thank you all again. We are now going into a networking break sponsored by Nestle Professional. Hopefully you all had a chance to make the zatar, ragu, and hummus from the recipe shared on Monday so that we can virtually share a snack even though we aren't all together. You can use the tabs on the left of your screen to check out a range of ways to engage with everyone who is also attending today.
In our Sessions tab, we have a special presentation at this break, a live demo celebrating protein diversity with Nestle Professional representatives Cassie Hoover and Chef Logan McCoy, sponsored by Nestle Professional. Throughout all of these activities, we hope you'll ask questions and join the conversation by clicking the green Share Audio and Video button in the Expo and Breakout sessions. In addition to our event chat, you can direct message any participant by searching for their name under the People tab. A red dot and number next to the envelope on the top right will indicate that you have a new message waiting. When in conversation with another attendee, connect live by clicking the Invite to Video Call button, which will populate a link to a private meeting room. Our networking feature matches you with another attendee for a quick four-minute chat. Today's networking question is, have you experienced interruptions in purchasing since the pandemic? We encourage you to meet a few new connections each week, just as you might strike up a conversation at the coffee station. At the end of one session, click the ready button again to be paired with another attendee. We encourage you to check out the Expo tab to visit with our sponsors, to watch live demos, hear about new product developments, consumer insights, sustainable operations, or thank them for their support of menus of change. And for those of you who are missing the sampling aspects of our in-person programs, head to the virtual tasting booth in the Expo, where you can register your interest in a product sample and virtual tasting experience. The sponsors featured and their theme programming will change week to week, so we hope you'll stop by there often. The themes for this week are listed here. Lastly, don't forget that you are entered in a raffle for each activity you engage in. And if you attend and participate in all six weeks, you'll have a chance to win free registration and travel to next year's Menus of Change Leadership Summit in Hyde Park, New York. We'll be resuming programming on the stage tab at 11.35 a.m. Pacific, 2.35 p.m. Eastern. So go enjoy networking and the expo until then.